Okay. Welcome to the Senior Community Center's Something to Talk About programs that are sponsored by Fieldstone's Communities, Bainbridge Island. Fieldstone offers memory care and is constructing assisted and independent living, now accepting residents. They also have day stay and respite programs. Call 360-689-4314 to schedule a tour of Fieldstone's apartments on beautiful Rolling Bay today. And we'd also like to acknowledge that we are gathering on the ancestral homeland of the Suquamish people, the people of the clear salt water, who have lived on the water of the Salish Sea since time immemorial. We honor them and are grateful for their hospitality. And today we are happy to have David Harrison give his views on what is going on in the political scene. Uh, there's a lot. David found his and served as the executive director of the Northwest Policy Center at the University of Washington and as a senior lecturer taught policy analysis for many years at the university's Evans School. Hey, good afternoon, David. Hello, looking forward to it. Let the record show that we're that my streak may or may not be broken since we've been together, you, I think you could fairly say that I've accurately predicted all the major things that were going to happen. But I'm on I'm on trial now because Reed has called me out for predicting that Joe Biden's not going to run. So we'll see. I, I stand by what I said, but it is getting closer and closer to the election. As you know, we're uh, taping this for people who watch it in between that we get quite a number of those folks. So your questions are not just for me, but of course uh, for them. And guided by Reed's wisdom, we, we generally uh, go for three separate topics, which today are uh, what's happening with the courts, especially with uh, ethical com complaints uh, uh, and problems. Uh, what's happening with DeSantis and his slippage and then uh, whether Biden's above the fray and what's happening on that side. Before we get into those three, and we'll stop after each of the three, as you know. Before we get into those three, I want to give a little sidebar on the House of Representatives and Ukraine. As you know, uh, there's a number of Republicans, especially in the House, who are Putin apologists or incredible isolationists. And basically, they, I think, uh, would be okay if if Putin's tanks rolled into Kiev. At least that's the way they're voting. Uh, so there was a showdown vote the other day, and uh, the protectors of intervention uh, um, welcomed that because they wanted the Margie Tra Taylor Greens of the world to get voted down. So on, uh, there was a relatively open rule on. Uh, the version of the Defense Authorization Act that the House sent to the Senate. And they did a number of, Republicans did a number of uh, mean-spirited things having to do with gender and choice and so forth. But they also uh, had an up or down vote on, on uh, blocking funds to Ukraine or severely reducing them. And they only got 80 votes for that amendment. Marsha Taylor Green style amendments. So that means we're, we're showing about two thirds, one third for Republicans on continued support for Ukraine, which is a good thing because it's not automatic that we're gonna win next year. And it's not automatic that the war will be over by then. So it's good to show uh, Putin that we have some resolve. So that's my story. Um, it, it is going to be interesting to watch what the hard right does and, and what McCarthy does about them. And that continues to include what is uh, the Rules Committee does because it's heavily weighted to the right. When they cut the budget deal, that McCarthy only had one vote to spare in terms of getting out of Rules Committee. So uh, that needs to be watched carefully. So let's start with the courts. Uh, uh, Reed wanted me to talk about uh, what the court or the Congress is going to do about the ethical complaints, primarily against Clarence Thomas for taking all manner of cushy vacations with 
with a, a party of interest in some of the cases that are settled, and he's been doing that uh, forever. Uh, and uh, some complaints also uh, against Alito and some a, a little bit against Sotomayor, which is a bogus deal about her promoting her book when she goes on speaking engagements. Anyway, the answer to what uh, the Senate is going to do about this is they're not going to do anything. All you're seeing here is the usual expression of political outrage. Um, you see it on both sides uh, uh, now and again over this or that issue where the it's very similar right now. McCarthy was on the tube this morning talking about his utter horror that the FBI doesn't know who took cocaine into the West Wing. I can promise you McCarthy doesn't care about that. All he cares about is embarrassing uh, the administration that they can't find the person. Uh, McCarthy, it's not a real concern. The ethics stuff is a real concern. That is the Senate, even Republicans in the Senate don't want undisclosed cushy vacations being taken by Supreme Court, court justices uh, with people who might have an argument for this or that on the court. Um, it's not, uh, what happened is uh, Judge Roberts issued a statement signed by all nine judges saying that they needed to look at uh, there are principles uh, and rules with the, in that regard, and that's what they're going to do. And you notice I said nine judges. The chances that Elena Kagan or Kentaji Jackson or, or uh, Sotomayor would say, no, Mr. Chief Justice, I'm not signing on to the ethics statement. That just wouldn't happen. Uh, the interesting that happened during the court as we did in, during this session is uh, we did notably better than we expected to do on two major cases. If you're into this, uh, a week ago on Sunday, there was an elaborate uh, evaluation by the New York Times about who was voting with who and making the argument that this was a better session than we expected. And uh, there were two monumental uh, cases in question. As you, a lot of you will remember, trillions of gallons of digital ink have been spilled uh, in the last year over the idea that the court was going to rule uh, in favor of the independent state legislature theory. There's been a lot of worry about that. And considering it would destroy our democracy, we're not wrong to worry about things like that. Uh, the worry would have been that Roberts would vote for with Sotomayor at all, and that Gorsuch and Amy Corning Barrett Kavanaugh would all rule that in North Carolina, that uh, the state Supreme Court had no right to oversee uh, the constitutionality of the conduct of the state of elections as determined by the state legislature. They were relying on. Uh, some language saying that the time, place, and manner of elections shall be determined by the state legislature. And so the state legislature argued that that decision, um, in this case over gerrymandering, was not reviewable. If the court ever agreed with that, that you couldn't oversee elections by ruling something unconstitutional, then, then elections as we know it in America would be over because a really partisan state legislature, say, 80, say Idaho, would just do what they wanted. So the courts are useful, including the federal courts. And in a um, six to three ruling, uh, Roberts, uh, Amy Coney Barrett, and Kavanaugh joined uh, the three liberals in saying that uh, that. Uh, normal judicial review of legislative actions is absolutely warranted and protected. It did have a note that implied that extraordinary review would not be warranted, but they didn't define what, the, what that was. So we're back to where we were. 
on elections integrity insofar as the courts uh, monitor uh, what happens in state legislatures. That's a huge thing. And it was followed by something that over time could be nearly as huge. And that is, as you know, uh, gaggles of uh, state attorneys general have been suing uh, Biden over pretty much everything he's done. I have to say when Trump was president, we were fond of Bob Ferguson uh, trying to get Washington State standing on various issues as well. The court has uh, looked with disapproval but by a vote of eight to one on states getting standing as states on pretty much everything. Basically, the argument in this case, this was an immigration case, was that uh, uh, the states were being wounded because Biden was prioritizing who would be charged uh, with violation of immigration law and arrested, tried, and deported. Um, Kavanaugh pointed out that Government presidents have been prioritizing how to enforce that law and what the highest priority for prosecution would be ever since the law existed, Republicans and Democrats. And basically what the court said is it's insufficient for states. States cannot get standing by saying that the efforts of the president are affecting their pocketbook. Basically what Kavanaugh said is that's the standard then basically uh, the states would have standing to contest every federal action that took place. So it's way too broad uh, for the court. And that's a good thing for us in terms of uh, allowing Biden to do his job. Uh, meanwhile, we lost, as you know, uh, uh, I mean, we all have some mixed feelings on how effective affirmative action has been, but we also lost on uh, student loans. Um, Biden announced uh, $40 billion of relief today that will be uh, protected. I wasn't surprised. I don't, I think it's a pretty ambitious reading of the statute that says Joe Biden could forgive $800 billion of student loans because of the COVID emergency. I, I'm not surprised that the court didn't agree with that. Um, so that's my report on the court, and that's where I'll stop for questions, thoughts, concerns, insights, and insults before we move on. Yes. Bonnie. Um, you want to unmute yourself, Bonnie? She, did, she is. Okay. okay. I just wondered what you think the possibility of getting any term limits for the court might be. Is that? I think none, you'd have to change the constitution. So you'd have to have a two thirds. Uh, well, I actually, Christine is gonna correct me, aren't you? You don't have to change the constitution. You'd have to get, you could, the terms are not in the constitution. They're by, they're by statute. And uh, still there's no chance that that's gonna happen. It would break down, um, you'd have to, um, it's too much of a departure from the established bipartisan order of the U.S. Senate to think that that would happen. Okay. Um, Reed. Yeah, I'm just wondering about following up on what Bonnie was talking about. Um, John Roberts has talked a whole bunch about how important it is for the court to be respected and he's denied that there's, you know, any kind of political swaying and that we're above politics here at the court. And of course, some other associate justices have said that too. Does it seem though that um, Roberts might come under pressure to try to do what you were talking about earlier, which is uh, try to move towards some sort of ethics agreement? Yeah, I think I, I meant to say that you know, he's announced that he will, and the, not, the nine, uh, um, sorry, I made that not clear. They will come up with some improvement. Uh, I think it will be generally seen as insufficient, but they'll come up with something 
that justices have to disclose or do that they don't presently disclose or do. And that is, as you point out, part of Roberts's thing. Um, he's taking uh, this, he's, he's not Earl Warren or he's not, he's not gonna be a, he's not a centrist. He, they, he's authors plenty of awful decisions, but it is interesting to see and that at least Kavanaugh and Gorsuch have joined him a lot and that he wasn't able to get them to do that on, on Dobbs, the choice decision, but he, as the Times points out, he has in several other instances, leading some conservatives to say that this new uh, set of judges that Trump appointed are, that are, need to be more like Alito that's specious because if Trump had nominated anybody close to Alito, then Murkowski and Susan Collins at all, he, he, uh, he wouldn't have gotten the 50 votes that he needed. He nominated the people who are extremely conservative justices that he could get ratified. And that's who we got. It's nice to see a little touch of independence and I wouldn't want to overstate it, but these, I would say these two cases are great, just great. Um, other questions on the courts? So let's go to what we, <laughs> you know, it seems like we've been talking about DeSantis and all for, for a while and, and, uh, and we have, uh, but it is kind of weird. Um, so the polls say, that 44% of Republicans, 63% of independents, and well over 80% of Democrats do not want Donald Trump to run. And of course, part of the reason he's running is he's, he's facing soon another couple of felony charges. And, and he thinks that there might be some protection, both in always running and in possibly winning. Uh, so, so he's already talking about who we would pardon and so forth. We should have tried this on Bainbridge Island City Council. <laughs> we didn't get very many candidates this time. We got some good candidates, but if somebody had been able to escape being charged with a felony by running, maybe we would have gotten more candidates. So this is an idea and we, that you should pass on. At any rate, um, I think Trump's toast, and as you know, I've said that before, it seems odd because he's polling in the high 40s, but remember, he's not polling above 50, and, uh, and you know, which he's not polling nearly as well as he, of course, was uh, uh, last time he ran, and he's not going to. And remember, this summer, we have two major more felony charges that you could argue are considerably worse or more worrisome than the one that we just got. Uh, one will be, lately Jack Smith is pretty close to wrapping up the next charge. And I think it's pretty clear that it's gonna include uh, falsifying uh, certification of uh, electoral voters voters in electoral college. It's gonna be a major election fraud charge. And then uh, finally Willis in Fulton County, Georgia, will that grand jury just convene and they'll charge him and Giuliani and others with election fraud in, uh, in Georgia. Um, Nikki Haley knows that's gonna happen. That's why she's there. None of these folks would necessarily be taking on Trump if if he wasn't uh, a soon to be convicted felon. And so uh, the issue uh, is for a long time, the remaining Koch brothers and others thought that the DeSantis was a MAGA era parent and was the answer to their problem. They would just switch the maniacal hate filled governance a model from Trump to DeSantis who had a, a nice election victory in Florida. Remember, DeSantis beat a man who's a perfectly good guy, but was at least the most washed up politician 
in Georgia. He squeaked by in the primary, Charlie Crist, beating a very popular Democratic candidate. Um, and, and he got whopped. But at the same time, we got almost 48% of the, uh, Boyden got almost 48% of, of the vote in Florida. And he would have won if it hadn't been for the Cubans in Dade County who vote consistently, Cuban Americans uh, vote Republican. So we shouldn't overdo in thinking that DeSantis owns Florida. At any rate, people wanted him to be the heir apparent. They did not bargain for, for uh, Trump hating him. Trump's, Trump is not pretending, he does hate him. So, and in response, you know, the other day, Sheila Kerwin, where, where are you, Sheila? Sheila Kern's one of the nicest people I've ever met. She posed a picture of, of her with various baseball players at the All-Star game, Joe Pinheiro, who looks like he's still young enough to, to pitch. And if Ron, Ron DeSantis, if you asked him, what is, he hates Sheila Kern, and he, or when, and he, he's never met her. He hates a lot of people. I mean, he's a hater, that's who he is. It's inexplicable how he's decided uh, that that's, that's uh, who he is. And the longer he goes, the more grievances he files. He's, 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 uh, he's, he's got, to, he makes Trump look like somebody you'd like to invite over for tea. So why is he doing that? I think he's doing that because he figured that the lane all to himself that he'll take on the idea of having somebody in a different lane after he wins the MAGA vote and after Trump fails on the weight of uh, charges that he's a felon. That's all I can figure, that, he, that running to the right of Trump on COVID, guns, choice, uh, uh, seems weird to me. I wouldn't have expected that. Um, but he, that's what he's running, and it's already showing uh, in uh, independent voters disapproving and major donors walking away. He's creating some room for somebody not named DeSantis or Trump. There's got to be another lane. And here's why it's especially important. Who's the minority party on choice, uh, on international security, on election denialism? Republicans. So if you're the minority party on a lot of things, you better run somebody that independent voters like on some kind of visceral level. And that's what, that's the Tim Scott and Nikki Haley lane. So these folks have interesting personal stories, you know, of fighting adversity, and they're not always snarling at you. And that's the lane, they're, they're not running, necessarily so much to uh, the center from Trump, except they're not election denialists. They'll say that election is over and it was resolved. And, and so other than that, politically on choice, um, uh, they're, they're just pretty much the same as Trump. The lane they're in is uh, a MAGA person, mostly MAGA person who, understands that we have a constitution and shouldn't be uh, dividing America on an hourly basis. That's the lane they're in. And they're hoping through New Hampshire and Iowa to see some sorting out between Trump and DeSantis. And one of them, or Pence, is hoping to be the emerging king of, the, of lane number two, the alternative that will keep the Republican party from splitting wide open. And uh, that's what they're fighting for And a few percent. And you know, all of a sudden Nikki Haley gets 9% and Trump and uh, Tim Scott gets 6%. All of a sudden that's gonna be meaningful that, that uh, um, and all of a sudden you'll say the, the articles will be with Trump failing, you know, can Haley catch up with DeSantis? Unless there's no chance of that. And then uh, Republicans will turn, as I've noted to Glenn Youngkin, who's governor of Virginia, that's slightly to the center of Trump. And uh, that could happen. Uh, and he talks, he's, you know, he makes sure 
that people ask him about it all the time. They say that Brian Kemp wants that role. I can promise you two people who aren't going to be president, Brian Kemp, because he didn't agree to committing election fraud in Georgia, and Mike Pence, who didn't agree to commit election fraud in the United States Senate. So they're not going to be elected. Actually, Pence has a little lead on Haley and Scott. It doesn't matter. So that's my view. Uh, the summer debates, the fall debates, they'll keep on talking. It's to our advantage that they'll keep on ripping each other. Trump says the reason he attacks DeSantis so much is DeSantis is in second place. That's sort of true. He also hates DeSantis. Um, and he gives Nikki Haley twice the deference that, that he gives uh, DeSantis. So that's my view of where we stand presently on uh, the Republicans. Mr. Price. Okay, you are pretty confident, and I can't argue with the idea that Trump is not going to get elected president again. Would you put any odds on whether he can manage to hold on to the nomination? Or do you think that that's also similarly impossible? I think, you know, uh, Liz Cheney was saying the other day that there'll be three candidates if Trump's the second candidate. You know, that's always kind of dangerous for us considering Trump's level of support from, you know, 35% of Americans. But uh, no, I do not think he will be nominated. Um, uh, I think the first weakness showed in, in, in uh, Iowa, the reason he's so mad at Governor Kim Reynolds is she said she would be neutral and she keeps on finding ways to appear with DeSantis. Uh, Trump knows that all of a sudden, if his number in Iowa is 30 something, and DeSantis is in 26, and the rest is uh, scattered, that his, the myth of his uh, uh, better electability will, will vanish. So, no, I don't think he will be nominated. Um, but stranger things have happened. He is, Nominated twice already, so there are, there's got to be crazy people in America. There is, I, he has outdistanced James McCann, and James McCann was an awful president. He led us into the Civil War. He didn't do anything to prevent it. He was not a good person. Uh, Trump is a worse president than that because of his profound uh, disrespect for the Constitution is unparalleled. Um, other questions? We have a little time left to talk about the Democrats. Uh, notice we're not talking about what legislation is in Congress. So that wonderful period of time with Joe Manchin, Cinema's 50th vote, reconciliation. You remember right now they're administering the things they passed. So, so uh, uh, Buttigieg was down and Skamania County or somewhere with Mary Catwell cutting ribbons on a railroad crossing. They're dotting, they're crossing America, cutting ribbons for big infrastructure projects. They passed a technology competitiveness bill on microchips. Uh, they passed uh, huge climate incentives that are underway. So remember, we got all those things. I think the best set of legislation since the New Deal. So. Um, it's time, of course, then uh, to uh, thank Joe Biden and ask him to retire because um, we're, we're at risk if, if Joe Biden runs for this reason. Um, he might beat Trump or DeSantis, probably would, could, unless he gets the nomination in August and has a event in September, I or falls. I was walking with a friend the other day at Bainbridge Striders and I was saying, uh, Jim, you know, it's an inexorable truth when you're 80 that you're not as healthy as when you're 60. And he said, oh no, Joe Biden is the exception. He's one of a kind. I'm here to tell you that's not true. It isn't true. He isn't one of the kind. He's facing the same cellular modification and cognitive challenges that are the joys of 
me being 75. And I think it's, I'm sorry that that's the way it is, uh, but it totally is a statistical truth that people are less likely to be fit to be president mentally and physically when they're 80. So the danger for us is not that he, I mean, there's all sorts of dangers. The biggest danger is not enough voters, that there would be too many voters worried about it, so many that they wouldn't vote for him especially if the candidate running against them is in their 50s. Um, that's why I'm thinking Haley, Scott, young, young kid. If they, they run somebody a generation and a half younger, uh, that's very worrisome, especially if Joe Biden's, you can see the difference in the last two years in terms of stiffness of joints and so forth, if, if uh, that continues to evidence itself on the doom. So um, let's talk about uh, how this would all play out. Lyndon Johnson didn't pull out of the presidential race in 1968 till March of next year, March of the election year. And as you remember, that was Eugene McCarthy, Bobby Kennedy, Hubert Humphrey. There was plenty of time to fight. It was an awful fight uh, where, um, uh, Hubert Humphrey was just strong enough to get the nomination, but there was so much turmoil, we gave the election to Richard Nixon by a little bit. Um, so obviously we're hoping that wouldn't happen. Biden would have to stand aside by the end of the year. And as I've said to you before, I think that's an opening for, for governors. Stand aside, Gavin Newsom. I don't think it's an opening for Gretchen Whitmer, in my view. I think uh, people say we're not going to elect a woman president. We did. Hillary won by three million votes. Give me a break. Of course, we're going to elect a woman president. Let's just hope Republicans don't elect Nikki Haley first. So um, Klobuchar is very interesting, but as I mentioned before, uh, she would have to give up her seat. She's up this time. So last time it was a free run for her. She didn't have to give up her Senate seat. And this time uh, she would, so I think she won't do that. Uh, so in the wings uh, is probably Whitmer. Kamala may well want it badly. So we'll see what happens. What I wanna add to this discussion is um, the states we could pick up, uh, which I think is our bonus round. So as you remember, we barely won Georgia. We were watching it. It's scary. We barely won Wisconsin, Georgia, Arizona, Nevada. And if you look at the numbers, Republicans got, Trump got more than 47%, 48% in uh, Michigan uh, and Pennsylvania. So uh, we have to hold on to all those states. Of course, we do get 300 some electoral votes like we did last time. It would be good for us to open up some states. So consider states that we got 46% last time and think what choice could do and demographic change could do. So in all four of these states, uh, choice is a pitched battle that brings people to the polls so we wouldn't necessarily even get to the polls and is by itself enough to take a 46% election and win it if it sets up that way. Uh, these states are North Carolina, Florida, um, Texas, and what am I forgetting? Um, North Carolina, Texas, Florida, and Ohio. So in all four of those states, we got 46% or 45.8 and more. In all those four states, it's a huge back battleground over choice. And in all four states, uh, or three of them, Florida, North Carolina, and Texas, we have significantly increasing non-white populations that are more likely to vote Democrat than Republican. Do you know that since the turn of, in the last 20 years, the population of Texas has grown by 8.3 million people and 7.6 million of them are, are non-whites. So that's, they're holding on Abbott and Ted Cruz and those folks 
by their thumbnails, and it could be this time uh, uh, that one of these strong candidates, Allred or Gallego, will, uh, not Gallego, that's Arizona, that one of the uh, strong candidates will prevail. There's already a big lose cruise pack. I wouldn't, uh, I would count uh, Texas as impossible. My favorite is North Carolina, my blog that's just coming out. I'm raising money for uh, uh, Mi Familia Vota, which registers uh, Latino voters to increase the registration of a million Latinos that live in North Carolina. I think, uh, you know, we got 49%. We almost won with Sherry Beasley. We just missed winning the presidential race there. We won it in 2008. Uh, uh, Obama won, and we've lost nearly ever since. We can win that back. The more uh, presidential states we win for president, more Senate seats will protect or pick up. And of course, our big two secret weapons are uh, choice voters and uh, non-white voters. So this is the summer to stay awake. In Ohio, as some of you know, there's a showdown already because uh, there will be enough votes on the ballot uh, for there to, to protect choice in November. And so Republicans are putting an initiative up in August to try and change the vote necessary in November from 50% to 60%. But to make things more complicated, the vote in August is 50%. So all, all we gotta do is get 51% of the people who say that they want it to be 50% in the fall. So we might well be able to do that. And that is a way to organize for Sherrod Brown, who's up this uh, next, next fall. So that's my view. Hope Joe Biden will step aside if you want a president a year from November. Certainly he could win. But is this a risk you want to take? I think uh, now's the time to decide not to take the risk. It is true that he looks like he's running, but I promise you if he was not running and he was trying to not be a lame duck, he would do exactly what he's doing right now, which is look like he's running. So I'm, I'm convinced that his campaign rallies mean that he's going to run. And what do you think of that? <laughs> well, I'm not sure who, uh... I mean, he's not helping anybody in particular to indicate that uh, he's going to step aside. And maybe that's because he's uncomfortable with the prospects of his vice president as a step in candidate, because although she's busy, she's not getting any of his love publicly. Well, I don't know. You know, it did seem like Obama had Biden by his side more. But I think some of that is the COVID. I said before, if you got to spend the first two years as vice president, uh, eight feet behind the president with a mask. I don't, uh, then that's not good, but I don't, I don't see him serving up juicy parts for her. She has now voted to break more ties in the Senate than any vice president in history. True. So that's, that's a nice thing that, that uh, said is, we can lose Manchin or somebody send him a now and again and still get a tie and have her break it. I don't know what happened. I felt fine about her. I, she just hasn't struggled. Um, Sheila. She doesn't excite me. <laughs> so I'll say that. Um, the uh, I wanted to know about Gavin Newsom. And uh, of course, I have to bring his name in, Pete, you know, Mayor Pete. I've yeah. got to bring him in because um, I believe in him. Um, and I see he and Chaston out there all over the place. So um, what do you think? So um, I think that Gavin Newsom, that, that being from California has become something new. And I don't know why that is. He's running a huge state, but I think California uh, becomes points against. Um, it is, you know, it's funny, there are so many politicians speaking so often on so many things with such articulation or not. Uh, it is hard to figure out level of authenticity. 
for instance, I've known Patty Murray since she was a state senator. And I'm, I'm, look, I'm here to tell you, you couldn't find a more real person than Patty Murray. I'm just saying, you're not getting layer after layer of, of artifice with Patty Murray. And I think Pete Buttigieg is the real thing. I, it is true that he, he made himself an impeccable uh, resume other than the political disadvantage of being gay in America, which remains, although mercifully much less of an issue than it was uh, uh, 20 years ago. Uh, I think Pete Buttigieg is disadvantaged by being transportation secretary. I think he, it happens to be a time when we have huge gas price fluctuation and trains derailing and horrible problems with air traffic control. And I think that turns out to be the wrong portfolio. To, I don't know what the right portfolio is, but I don't, I don't think uh, that served him well. But I also think if you're a cabinet secretary, just how you run against the vice president, I don't know how you do that. It's possible. He would be served well. He would he would care about the effectiveness of government. I, I would like I would love to see Gretchen Whitmer and Pete Buttigieg on the uh, well. That would make me a very happy person. Mm -hmm. I think I could do that. <laughs> we need to change generations. We've been with this generation of. I mean, these folks are all older than Clintons. They're way older than Obama. Um, what we're doing with my generation still running for office is unclear. I give, don't get me wrong, I love Joe Biden. I just don't want to lose. I, my priority, I'm not afraid of, I got, when I first started talking about Joe Biden not running, I got some blog email saying, David, don't help make this an issue. That's so crazy, it's, it is an issue. People know about Joe's, 70% of Americans don't want Joe to run the, a lot over his health. And, and it's, there's no way we can make an, is, an issue. If we ignore the issue, then that would still be an issue. Read. It's tremendously successful. I mean, I think that given the difficult hand that he was dealt, with even when he had support in uh, in the House, um, I mean, we're as you said, they're executing on the bills they passed, yeah. and so I think that you know nobody. I think he was the right person for this term, but uh, I'm with you. I don't think that it's good, that it bodes well for him to try to hang in there. It just eventually looks like a difficult transition, but eventually there's going to be a book. Or if somebody divulges what happened on Super Tuesday uh, two and a half years ago, because as you remember, he was like third in Iowa and fifth in New Hampshire, and all of a sudden he won in, in, in uh, South Carolina, and all of a sudden, other before Super Tuesday, and all of a sudden, other candidates are withdrawing, like, oh, well. And I, I to this day think that that was uh, Obama. Biden engineering partnership where they decided that they couldn't run it out all through the spring and summer and still beat Trump. I um, could see I could see a, a story where Kamala has great support from parts of the population that are not widely covered. Um, uh, people of color and uh, well, I think she helped him. Well, I, th I think she was good for the ballot. Uh, it was Obama. I was saying. Uh, yeah, but I'm just uh, saying that that as a as if Biden were to step aside, it might be that she has lined up support that is not evident to those of us who watch the mainstream press. Yeah, I think she would. It'd be interesting to see her, well, how she polls against Haley and DeSantis. But yeah, you do get the feeling that 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 we we're not where we would like to be on that. So we're way ahead of our usual hour long of talk. Do we have other, not way ahead, but a little bit ahead, other questions, thoughts, or concerns? We're really done. Yeah, I do. 
Christina. Yes. It's Marcy. I'm, yeah. I'm not. Uh, oh, which one do you want first? Sorry, I'll shut Go up. Go ahead, Christina. Okay. I'm not disagreeing with you. I think choice, I think it was underestimated at the uh, midterms. I think the Republicans thought, oh, we got this and it just exploded. And I think choice is going, I agree with you there. Um, but I'm wondering how much the um, continued progress with the DOJ and the January 6th in general might bring um, some of the independent voters and maybe some moderate conservatives more to the um, uh, center where we can pick them up. Um, I'm the thing is that I have a bias. I follow what's going on with even the people that were on the ground in at, at the Capitol, and we have well over a thousand um, mm -hmm. that have been convicted so far, found guilty, and they're still charging. Um, but is that playing well? Are people seeing how extensive? this has been that it might bring some of those moderate conservatives or independents over over to our side i don't i don't think so but i i i don't i i could look we could both look at the polling on this i think uh you remember it during the last week of of uh, the election when biden did stuff in philly and was talking about the challenges to democracy or so. I think uh, 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 independence, that, that resounded with independence and there's some uh, post-election interviewing that seems to support that, but I don't think it's so much uh, arresting those thousand people as it is the broader challenges to the democracy that uh, Trump represents. So I guess that's the cousin of what you're saying. I don't think it's the, the concentrated uh, uh, arrests and trials that, that does that. Um, but I think uh, the continued level of denialism in the Republican Party hurts them with independent voters who vote after all and want, want to believe that the, there's some legitimacy to the process. Did you see that uh, the my pillow guy Trump's friend had a $10 million challenge if anybody disapproved his uh, argument uh, that it was fraud, that uh, we cheated him. And he just lost that if uh, some kind of panel is going to give this account $10 million. So I, I got to find that link and put it in the blog. I think not, Christine. I think the number one issue is uh, choice. I think we could wedge. Uh, the Putin thing, I think uh, casting too many Republicans as Putin apologists would be a nice do. And but democracy in general is a nice issue for independence. I think those are winners. Uh, uh, Marcy. Marcy, did you have something? Yeah, I had a question with the ERA. There is this um, talk about all they need is to get the time changed in, in Congress. I mean, they, Congress set up the time frame. Congress can change the time frame because it's a valid constitutional amendment already. And that they then would get Republicans voting against it. That would help turn yeah. around the, a lot of the independents. I don't know if that's accurate. I'm just curious what you thought about that as a, something we should be looking at. I, I would have to study it. I'd be surprised yeah. if you could constitutionally change the date to get you your 38th state. Yeah, apparently. But I, I know you could do it, whether whether the Supreme Court would allow you to, yeah. to do it, um, I don't know. But I'll study up on it and yeah. we can talk about it a month from now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we also had one in the chat uh, from uh, well, Madeline. For I just oh, want to pop in oh, here. Yes. And I just want to. I just want to say that Marcy just had a big birthday yesterday. Woo. So, happy birthday, Marcy! Happy birthday, Marcy! Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you, Senior Center. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we have a check. Congratulations, yes. Marcy! It's uh, Madeline Fox. She goes. Any thoughts about third party candidate? You know, um, Mansion has been talking about it. And I, and Kasich was, uh, I'm worried about 
all of them because I'm just worried about um, an IOPCO Republican getting 40 and us getting 35 and the third party candidate getting 25. Think of Ralph Nader running in Florida or Jill Stein running when Hillary ran. It's just, so I don't know. I don't know a third party candidate that would work uh, uh, except maybe if, if, uh, if John McCain was suddenly 60 years old and alive. Uh, no, I, I, if the processes are Madeline, the processes of getting on the ballot are so hard. Yeah, that's fine. I just saw some little video by Larry Hogan with an interview that he's saying, you know, that they're, you know, he's considering, you know, that people are going to see what happens. And um, if there looks like there's some reason that, you know, they should be thinking about it. I think he's thinking about it. One thing. Uh, it's interesting because here you have a Republican governor from Maryland and you think, well, wouldn't that help us? I'm not so sure. I don't think so. Um, <laughs> He's like a third party, yeah, sort of thing. So I don't know. It's, it's certainly up in the air. Who knows if they could call Well, it. I think they're worried about Trump getting the nomination. So I right. think they would, they would keep their options open. But we would have to worry about whether uh, Liz Cheney said, you know, I'm not going to do anything that increases Trump's chances. So mm -hmm. I, think, I think they're worried about it, too. Right. Okay. So let's see what happens. Uh, let's think of, we'll think of uh, ways to branch out so we're not always just talking about what our annoying person DeSantis is, but um, I think I already told you that what Peggy Newman said, that you don't plug our life support to charge his cell phone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he would, so. Absolutely. Well, as you started, to, as you said earlier, we haven't the uh, opportunity to talk about any legislation because nothing's actually moving yeah. because of what's going on in the House. Maybe next time we'll talk a little bit about state legislatures and the ones that are up this fall, because Christina knows where Virginia is. And uh, we did a nice, we had a nice time this last election, shifting some state legislative votes. Um, and yeah, we could talk a little bit about Washington. You know, we got a very active governor's race and now attorney general's race where there are people who are lining up. And, uh, Be sure to, when you go state, uh, talk to Wisconsin. Okay, that's that's a tough. That's that's an interesting situation over there. Yeah, I wish we had had another hundred thousand votes. We almost did that. That would have been so right. Cool. Right. Uh, <laughs> Can we possibly have Ron Johnson have to run again sooner? Than yeah, that would be nice. <laughs> yeah, this will be his awesome. last term. You just have to endure it for five and a half. Months. It comes from the um, right part of the state. That's why. So thank you all. Thank um, you, David. And a good time. And thank you, David. Let's, let's talk soon. Okay. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.